Hello, welcome to the second video on negligence. This is going to focus on the breach of duty. There is a previous video covering duty of care and how that's established. You can go ahead and watch that first if you've not seen that one. But this is the breach of duty, the second element. This is obviously negligence, tort law paper. So, as mentioned there, there are three main elements. Uh, duty of care, breach of duty and damage cause, which we look to to establish a successful claim of negligence. We've added in there the idea of no defence. There are a number of reasons for this, but obviously each of these is going to be a separate video. Duty of care is the video before this one, and we'll focus on breach of duty right now. So breach of duty then. Uh, once a duty of care has been established, the claimant must satisfy to the court that the defendant broke or breached the duty of care by failing to reach the standard of care required. So this is known as the standard of care of the reasonable man. And this definition comes from Blythe and Birmingham Waterworks, so the ordinary person performing the particular task is expected to perform it reasonably competently. And of course, the phrase the reasonable man would be adopted to reasonable person, but we're talking from a definition from 1856. And you might also read that the reasonable person or reasonable man is the man on the Clapham omnibus. So it is an objective test. Uh, the peculiarities of the person performing the task are irrelevant. So we're just judging a person as to an out objective or outside perspective. So of course, breach of duty, then the standard demanded is not perfection, but is reasonableness. So the question is, what would a reasonable person have done in that situation? And you may find that a defendant may do the best he can, but still may be found to be negligent. And this is, of course, the fault element of the tort of negligence. Once there's a duty, have we fallen below the standard expected of us? So an example here, we've got Chittock and Woodbridge School. A 17-year-old student was seriously injured on a school trip after disregarding teacher's instructions and warning notices and went skiing off-piste on his own. Now, Lord Justice Old told us uh, said the teachers owed a duty of care to the pupils on the trip, but the standard required was no more than that of the reasonable parents taking into account the boy's age, his skiing experience, and the teacher's responsibilities for the rest of the group. So in this case, they found there was no breach of duty. Now, there's a, a quote as well from uh, Farden, Farden and Harcourt Rivington from 1932, uh, which tells us that while people are expected to guard against reasonable, reasonable probabilities, they're not bound to guard against fantastic possibilities. Now, fantastic just means outlandish or unforeseeable possibilities. So once we have established the duty of care, we need to understand that a person can fall below it. That is what we call breach of duty, of course. And to do that, we have to ask two questions, really, two main questions. What is the standard of care required? Now, that relates to the defendant. So we're looking at what standard, what are they doing, and to what standard are they expected to do the task to. And then we need to look at the circumstances, and these are the risk factors. So these are things which may higher or lower the duty expected from the starting point of that standard of care. So we're obviously going to explain each of these two, uh, and along with some common law and case law to explain how each factor works. And we're going to begin with the idea of standard of care. So, from Blythe and Birmingham Waterworks then, the standard of care expected of a person ordinarily in negligence is the ordinary person performing the particular task is expected to perform it reasonably competently. So we've got the man on the Clapham omnibus as a famous sort of quote of that person. If you plucked a man from a bus, well, what would they do? And that comes from the case of Hall and Brooklyn's Auto Racing Club. And in essence, the reasonable man is an objective standard, but... The following needs to be taken into account. Now, if the defendant is a learner or learning a skill, we have to consider what impact does that have. If the defendant is a professional or if the defendant is a child or youth. So all of those may alter, apart from the learner issue, at the standard of care. So the starting point is that person, the ordinary person performing a task. Now, from the case of Wells and Cooper, this gives a good description. Okay, so in this case, a man fits the new door handle to the back of the door of his house, and the door was difficult to close at the top of some stairs. On the day of the accident, the claimant was leaving the house and pulled the door too hard to shut it, and the handle came away in his hand, and he fell down the steps and was injured. Now, fitting a door handle is the job of a carpenter, normally, 
So the defendant in this case was judged by the standard of the reasonable competent carpenter. And it was held that a reasonably competent carpenter uh, could have done the work to, would have done the, the work to the similar standard as a man doing DIY in his house. So he had reached the standard of reasonably competent person attaching a door handle and therefore would not breach the duty. In Condon and Barsley, we have a reckless tackle in the Sunday League football match led to a broken leg. Now, the Court of Appeal said that the participants in competitive sport owe a duty of care to one another to take all reasonable care, having regard to the particular circumstances and upheld the judge's award of £4,900 in compensation. So what we've got here is the defendant fell below the standard of the reasonable footballer at that level. So we've mentioned there are three factors which could alter the standard of care. Um, really speaking, learners is one of them, but only so we suggest that it's the same standard. Um, and often in exam questions, learners might be in there or trainee doctors might be in there to sort of get you to talk about the concept of learners and how they still owe the same standard. So it doesn't actually alter the standard. Uh, indeed, if we look to Nettleship and Weston, uh, the claimant was a non-professional driving instructor here and the defendant was a learner driver on a third lesson in a car which didn't have dual control. So that's where there's sort of brake and accelerating pedals in both sides of the car. Now she failed to straighten up after turning a corner and hit a lamppost, injuring the passenger who was her instructor. And it was held in this case the learner driver's standard of driving is that of the reasonably competent driver, not the standard of a learner driver. Now, there are several justifications for this. So, for example, a learner driver would be paying insurance, even if by proxy. And, of course, in terms of accidents and so on, we should help people out. But if you're going to take to the road, you should be judged competently. So, it's more of a policy decision. But what stems from that is, first of all, we've got that duty of care, as we mentioned, with Nelson from Western, um, driver, passenger, and so on. But if one is learning a skill, then they're judged as somebody competent in that skill. So if they're a trainee doctor, trainee chef, anything with training in or learning the skill, they'll be judged by someone competent. And of course, exam questions will sometimes put some words in there to get you to that effect, to get you to talk about the idea of the standard remains the same. So in Wilshire and Essex, uh, we've got the case here that involved a junior doctor. Now, a junior doctor isn't necessarily inexperienced. A junior doctor could be somebody uh, who is just not a consultant. But the claimant here was, uh, was born prematurely and suffered damage to his sight, which was attributed to the negligence of the defendants, amongst other factors. Now, one of the doctor defendants was junior and had limited experience, so he was a trainee new doctor. And the Court of Appeal said, while acknowledging the difference between consultants and juniors, made the point that the standard of care would not be reduced on the basis that since patients had an expectation of and dependence on the doctors who treated them. So learners, trainees, they judge the, they're judged to the same standard as someone competent in that skill. But now we have the opposite end of that spectrum. The second consideration is, is the defendant a professional? Now if they are, what they, the standard they're judged by is the conduct uh, needs to fall below the standard of the ordinary competent professional. So it's not the man doing the skill, it's the competent professional. So. If the person's a doctor, they're judged by the standard of the reasonable doctor as opposed to a reasonable person. You know, for example, if you were to do brain surgery, then you would probably not do it as well as a brain surgeon. So, of course, you would want in any negligence claim uh, to be judged by the standard of the reasonable brain surgeon, not the reasonable man, because otherwise there would never be any negligence. Uh, so, yeah, that's the first thing we need to consider. But the second is sort of acts as a defence. So if there is a substantial body of opinion within the profession that this course of action will be taken, then there is probably not going to be a breach of duty. So let's look at that in action. So in the case of Bolam and Friend Hospital Management Committee, uh, Bolam was advised by the consultant at the hospital to undergo electroconvulsive shock therapy for his mental illness. Now he'd signed a consent form but wasn't warned of the risk of breaking bones while strapped down and undergoing the therapy. So relaxant drugs were not used by the hospital, which would reduce the risk of bone breaking, and Bolam suffered a broken bone. Now, in this case, it was decided a man need not possess the highest expert skill 
it is sufficient if he exercises the ordinary skill of an ordinary competent man in exercising that particular art. So in this case, there was a body of opinion which suggested the same thing would have been done in other hospitals and there was no breach of duty. But we need to contrast this slightly with Belido and City and Hackney Health Authority. In this case, the claimant suffered brain damage as a result of a doctor's failure to attend to clear a child's blocked airways by intubation. Now, there was a difference in medical opinion here, whether intubation was necessary in the circumstances. And so, despite the body of medical opinion in accordance with the doctor's practice, the House of Lords held that a doctor could be liable in negligence despite this. So, what we got there is the court can still decide that a body of opinion or practice of the profession is wrong. So, this it doesn't give doctors, and for example, that, that deal of protection it once afforded them this particular rule. Now, in the row and Minister of Health, we got here the glass ampules for anaesthetic were soaked in an antiseptic solution to prevent infection. Now, some antiseptic seeped in through invisible cracks in the ampules and contaminated the anaesthetic. Now, as a result, the claim was paralysed from the waist down because, of course, this anaesthetic was injected into them. Now, at the time, uh, the risk of this happening was not appreciated by competent anaesthetists in, in general. So, as it hadn't been had before, therefore, no duty of care had been broken. So, when a reasonable man cannot know a, a standard procedure is in fact dangerous, he will not breach his duty of care. If we look into the standard of professionals, we're now going to look from a sporting context. In this one, it was a professional referee. Now, in this case, it was a rugby game, uh, and the scrum collapsed, and the claimant was injured, leaving him in a wheelchair. Now, the referee, in this case, had fallen below the standard expected of him in managing the scrum, and was liable for the injuries, so he allowed the scrum, the scrum to collapse. Now, the Welsh Rugby Union was also vicariously liable for the injuries, because, of course, they appoint the referees. Now, in terms of vicarious liability, there is a separate video on that if you wish to, to look at that. The final factor then which may alter the standard of the reasonable person is if the claimant, or sorry, the defendant is a child. So another kind of famous case in terms of the duty of care owed by children or whether it's breached is Mullins and Richards. Now in this case, friends were sitting next to each other uh, at their desk in school and they were hitting each other with plastic rulers pretending to have a, a sword fight. Now one of the rulers snapped and a fragment went into Mullins's eye and she lost all sight in that eye. Now, Richards was held to be the standard, or held to the standard, of a reasonable 15-year-old schoolgirl, not of a reasonable adult man. So, the Court of Appeal held that she had reached the standard of a reasonable 15-year-old schoolgirl, and therefore had not breached the duty. So, the duty is lowered with respect to children. So, once we've established in the scenario question as to whether the standard of care is owed, so we've got the ordinary person or it might be altered because the person's a professional or because the person is a child not altered because they're a learner remember then we need to consider the circumstances and they are the risk factors so what we when we talk about risk factors these alter the standard expected of the reasonable person so it could be the reasonable child and then we do these factors it could be the reasonable professional and then we do these factors but we need to consider those circumstances so you must first consider that starting point and then consider the following risk factors to see if the standard should be altered. So the four we're going to look at, uh, you might see these slightly differently in different variations, but with these you can't go much wrong. The likelihood or risk of harm, we're going to consider whether there are any special characteristics of the claimant, whether any reasonable precautions have been taken and any social utility was the risk worth taking. So we'll deal with each of these as we go. And what we do is once we've got these factors, we then make a balanced judgment. So according to these factors, has the defendant fallen below the standard? And we'll come back to that in a moment. But we're going to start with risk of harm. So the greater the risk, the more care needs to be taken. So the reasonable man takes more precautions where the risk is greater, but doesn't have to take precautions against highly unlikely events. So in Bolton and Stone, during a cricket match, a batsman struck a ball and hit a person who was standing outside the house on the, on the road outside the ground. Now the ball was hit out of the ground over a protective fence five metres high. 
The ground had been used as a cricket, uh, cricket ground for about 90 years. Now, six times in the last 30 years, a ball was hit out of the ground in that direction and no one had previously been injured. So the court decided here, the risk of injury to a person from a ball being hit out of the ground was so small that the probability of it happening would not have been anticipated by a reasonable man. So therefore, the cricket club had not broken its duty of care. We've dealt with this case already in duty of care as well, so Haley and the London Electricity Board. A blind man in this case was walking along the pavement on his way to work. He was using his white stick to go along a route he knew very well. Now the Electricity Board had opened a trench and warned of it in a then conventional manner of laying a tool on the ground and forcing people to walk around it. Of course, no barriers, no signs, what have you. Now, as about 1 in 500 people were blind or partially sighted, there was a, at least a big enough risk of this, and so the defendant should have taken precautions. So, this was foreseeable. The second factor we need to consider, then, is special characteristics. Now, I say second factor, of course, you could do these in any order, but the second in this uh, video. So if the defendant has any characteristics which make him more vulnerable in some way, and the defendant knows of this, then the defendant's standard of care will be raised, and it's best illustrated through case law, and a classic case of Paris and Stepney. Now, the claimant here was employed as a fitter in a garage. Now, his employer, the local council, knew that he had the use of only one eye, so while he was using a hammer to remove a bolt on the vehicle, a chip of metal flew off and entered his good eye. Now, the reasonable man takes more care where the situation demands it. In this case, the council didn't provide goggles for him to wear, as in 1950, it wasn't common practice. But the council knew he was blind in one eye and should have taken more care. And therefore, owed a higher standard because of this known increased risk. And because they didn't, they breached their duty. Now, again, we've got an employer in this case, uh, Walker and Northumberland County Council. The claimant here was a social services manager who had been forced because of funding shortages to take on a far higher volume of work than he could cope with. Now, he suffered several weeks of being unable to work because of a stress-related illness. Now, this became a special characteristic of, of Mr. Walker, which was known to the defendant. But when he returned to work, they made little or no effort to reduce the workload or improve the situation. He then suffered another long period of illness and then claimed in negligence for the damage caused as a result of this. And the court applied that Paris and Stepney would have counseled decision to this case and said the standard of care expected of an employer is raised if the employer knows that an employee is more likely to suffer injury. And of course, that includes mental injuries too. And again, we've got this idea of special characteristics. Haley and London Electricity Board, of course, uh, the claim was blind as we knew. So this is a special characteristic. Now, you don't have to know about the particular person, but knowing that there is those kinds of people around would be enough. Okay, the third in our risk factors then is reasonable precautions. So should the defendant have taken reasonable precautions? Now a trick here as well in any problem question is not just outlining that the defendant didn't take reasonable precautions, but always make that suggestion as to what they could have done. Now of course a defendant will have acted reasonably if he has taken on reasonable precautions. And again, the standard is not perfection, it is only reasonable. So what is reasonable? So in the case of Latimer and AEC, uh, the defender's factory was flooded after an exceptionally heavy rainstorm. Now the water mixed with some oil and this made the floor very slippery. Now the defendant put up warning signs, passed a message around the workforce and used all of his supply of sand and sawdust to try to dry the floor. Now despite all this, the claimant slipped and was injured. Now, the defendant, of course, owes a duty of care to employees, but it was held that he hadn't broken or breached the duty, as all reasonable pra practical precautions had been taken in the circumstances of the accident. Indeed, the only way it could have been made a lot more safe is to close the factory, which would have been an unreasonable precaution to have had to take. Now, we know in the case of Bolton and Stone, uh, again, there was no breach of duty, but in this case, erecting a five metre fence, it was enough in the sense of precautions which also could have been taken. So the claim would have also failed on this ground. So of course, a uh, quick one, there's no duty to eliminate all risks. So as shown in Latimer and Bolton and Stone, only reasonable precautions have to be taken. 
And the final element then is this idea of social utility. You might see this called public utility or social importance. But in essence, it means the same thing. So what we're saying here is, do the benefits outweigh the risks taken? So is there a public utility in taking that risk? So what this does is lower the standard of expected of the person if they're taking that justified risk. So of course, this is most likely to be where there are emergency services uh, in the scenario question, but most of the time it's not applicable. So there's a lower standard of care when reacted to an emergency. Now this could be, of course, a person helping someone else. But in what and half of your county council, uh, the firefighters were injured by lifting gear uh, when traveling in a vehicle not specifically fitted for carrying that gear. It was bolt cutting equipment for a car wreckage. Uh, the vehicle that of the firefighters should use was adapted to carry the gear, of course, but they did it quickly. Now the court held the firefighters were ready to uh, take the risk of using a vehicle to save a life. And what the court must do is balance the risk against the measures. So, and the benefit of saving a woman who is in the car wreckage was greater than the risk of injuring the firefighters who broke her leg by using this vehicle. Thus, the duty gate owed by the council had not been broken because of the uh, risk was worth taking. Now, quick note, of course, this is when the county council was in charge of the fire service. So to sum up then, so we need to, st our starting point needs to be the reasonable person standard. But then of course we address the standard of care. So is it altered in any way according to the characteristics of the defender themselves? So are they a learner, which doesn't change it, but we should mention it. Um, are they a professional or are they a child? And if any of these apply, that's our starting point. We then consider risk factors. So how is it altered? Now, when we've addressed those risk factors, what we need to do is uh, make a balanced judgment. There's no sort of one size fits all. But of course, if we look at seriousness of the risk, if it's more serious than our claimant, we should have taken more care if we haven't it's breached. Now, more than one of these factors can apply. So you could have added it's more serious to the claimant. The injury was also very likely to happen, so you should take more care. But then we balance that against, for example, social utility. So we do need to be addressing the risks, but of course, the more elements are satisfied, then of course the more care needs to be taken, the more chance there, uh, there is that the care has not been taken and there is a breach of duty. Okay, so in the context of where we're up to, we covered duty of care in the last video, this idea of Robinson, we need to use that to establish duty of care. Caparo and Dickman uh, may be used in those rare circumstances where there's a novel or a new case. In this video though, we looked at breach of duty and we looked at the starting point of the reasonable man standard and of course um, how that can be altered and then we looked at the risk factors so the next video is going to look at damage caused okay i hope you found this useful and thanks for watching the video